Welcome to the Human Rights Commission. Um, let's start by introducing ourselves and um, let's see. Denise, why don't you start? Okay, good evening. My name is Denise Janess and I'm the liaison for the Human Rights Commission. Diana? Hi everybody, I'm Diana Cass and I am a commissioner. Why don't you say a few words about yourself because we've got a new member and he'd like sure. to, he's going to introduce himself after a while, but he'd like to know who we are too, I think. Gotcha. Um, so Judah, I am, um, my day job is I am the diversity and inclusion program manager at the Veterans Hospital in Ann Arbor. Um, I also am the vice president of the Jim Toy Community Center in Ann Arbor. Um, I love diversity and inclusion. I love human rights. Um, and I'm currently um, working on my master's in uh, law, um, healthcare law from Seton Hall University online. Um, and I have a, a fabulous partner and a pretty awesome hockey playing girl 10 year old. Ooh. <laughs> Aisha. Aisha, you want to introduce yourself? Hi everyone. I'm Aisha. Hi. I'm I. Um, I am a lecturer at a lecturer at University of Michigan School of Social Work, and I head up their engage their community engagement initiative. I um, am also the head of an Asian American civil rights organization based in Detroit, and I am a com uh, Asian American commissioner on the Governor's MAPAC Commission. And I love human rights. I love civil rights stuff. I've been doing it for a long time. Oh. And I have a son named Noah who might show up and join the meeting. Kita? <laughs> yeah. Hi, everyone. My name's Kita. Hi. Miss you. Oh, you too. I'm a commissioner on the Human Rights Commission. I'm proud to say that. I uh, am an executive director of an agency that provides a whole host of support services and advocacy for uh, marginalized communities. I run the Washtenaw County uh, ID project, which is an ID card for those that cannot access a state ID. Um, I'm very proud of that project. Uh, I'm an attorney and um, I don't know. I believe in human rights at home. <laughs> Linda, thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, sorry about that technical difficulty. Um, uh, so Judah and I know have known each other for many, many years. So I don't think I need to introduce myself to him. And I think I know everybody else, but you know, I'm a lawyer, mediator, my last job was running mediation for the Catholic Church at the University of Michigan, that little school down the road. Um, and I'm on the Human Rights Commission. And, and Judah. Hi, uh, Judah Garber. I've been secretly a member of the commission for months, though you wouldn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I um, was uh, recently retired from the, um, I worked for the last 33 years or so for the Washtenaw County Trial Court, a friend of the court, that's the domestic relations arm of the court. And I was an attorney, a referee, and the last 20 years or so, a director, also a mediator and um, other roles. Um, I was the union chair for a while. Um, and uh, it, it, it's a pleasure to join this distinguished group and get a chance to wear my fancy work clothes that I haven't worn anything other than t-shirts for the last <laughs> three months. So. <laughs> Hello. Well, thanks for dressing up for us. <laughs> I thought the public was tuning in, so. <laughs> Thank you. And you'll have a chance to say a little more if you'd like later. But we have two city, uh, city council liaisons. Leslie, Leslie, did you introduce yourself? I was going to be last. Just oh, okay. Well, why not? Liaison, two uh, city council liaisons. Elizabeth, you want to start, introduce yourself? Sure. Um, 
Judah, I'm, I'm almost as new to the commission as you are. I've only had a few meetings. There was a reshuffling just in the last, well, gosh, it, time is measured differently now, but um, so I'm, I, I'm excited to have joined the HRC recently. I, um, outside of city council, I, I teach preschool. And a hundred years ago, I got a law degree and passed the Michigan bar, but I never practiced. Um, yeah, I'm just excited to be here because I the issues that are talked about at this table are really interesting to me. Julie. Hi. Um I neighbor of Judah's. You look great. You look great walking around the neighborhood. I don't know what you're talking about. Not this stuff. <laughs> um, so uh I have been on council for five and a half years, the last year and a half on this commission. Um professionally I'm a pre-health academic advisor at the university, which means right now I'm one of um, two full-time people trying to help over a thousand students and alums getting into the applying to health profession school. And um, and what else? I have my 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 academic background's in public health. I have um, a PhD in health services organization and policy, so I've been um, always interested in policy. Um, and privileged to get to actually help make some for the city and to be with all of you. Yes, we've got two people who are in this meeting who are helping us. Margaret Radabaugh, please introduce yourself. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Nice to meet you virtually. Um, I'm Margaret, I work in the city attorney's office. So I do labor and employment for the city um, and I work with the HRC on a number of issues, so I'm happy to be here as well. And nice to meet you. Nice to have you. Erin Suganama. Erin? Hi. Erin Suganuma, happy to be here. Ann Arbor resident, local social worker, uh, done substance abuse counseling, started a, a local nonprofit to help. Uh, people returning from prison and jail. Um, uh, I've uh, a criminal justice advocate uh, and <laughs> have recently started work with the sheriff's office as the re-entry coordinator. Thank you. Well, this is gonna be a good meeting. I'm Liz Danbaugh, I'm the chair of the Human Rights Commission. I am, um, I guess I, I was trained in political science, but i am uh, been a management, management consultant for a long time and um, a lot of my work had to do with integ integrating diversity into what everybody does for a living in, in business. And so I was just, this is something I've always wanted to do and I'm so glad to be on this commission like with you. Um, this is now a time for public comment and I, we are welcoming people from the public to come and comment to us. Um, we've set aside time for up to 10 speakers to speak about three minutes apiece. You don't, you're not required to sign in beforehand, but if you wish to speak, um, all you do have to do is call this phone number now, 877-853-5247 and enter the meeting code, which is 975-5945. 7438. Begin by stating your name and the topic you want to address. You'll get a warning cone after uh, when you have only 30 seconds left, and you'll be muted after three minutes so we can move on to the next speaker. Um, it's specified in our bylaws. We will listen carefully to your comments, but we will not respond to them during the meeting. If you want the HRC to have the ability to get in touch with you, please let us know by emailing uh, the commission at hrc at a2gov.org. Denise, are there any yes. questions? Waiting? I have one question here, but I don't see from whose hand that's coming from. Let me go to question and answer. No, that's a test, so we're good. It's just, is there a comment though? Somebody who was called in for public comment? No, I don't. Okay. Oh, here's Pam Dent coming. Connect. I don't know why I said, I said hers again, so. Okay. If Pam gets on, she can introduce herself and we can continue. 
Can you hear us, ma'am? I think not. What happened to her? I saw her. Okay, there she goes. Pam? I see your name up. I don't see anything. Pam? Oh, here we go. Pam? Where did she go? I don't know. Where's her camera? She's she's not on video at all. Pam, are you? Can you hear us? I have everyone set for video. Okay. Yeah. She may have turned it off. She's not muted. She's not connected either. Pam, if you can hear us, unmute yourself. Well, she's not muted. I don't know what it is. I think we. Okay. Um, okay, I have to get a little technical support on that. So you want to carry on? Yeah, you could. You might want to call her. Can you do yeah, that? Yeah, I have just had, I just emailed her. Okay. Well, then let's go on and look at the agenda and um, see if anybody would like to change anything on the agenda. Or would you like to make a motion to accept the agenda? I'll move to accept the agenda as is. I second. On, so, any, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No one. Agenda accepted. Um, Judah, you can come up next and say a few words about why you were willing to take on this exciting adventure. Sure, well, um, uh, the, the work I've been hearing about the work of the commission for many years from Linda, and it's uh, seemed really interesting. Um, I, as a um, county employee, I think I felt precluded from this sort of other um, engagement, but now that I'm not working for the county, it was, it was opened up. Um, I, uh, in my role at the front of the court, I, I frequently dealt with, uh, it was my job to deal with and investigate complaints about uh, systemic uh, discrimination or rights violations, either regarding a particular case or some sort of systemic problem with, with the whole organization. So I'm sort of familiar with that um, process of uh, you know, examining and investigating and, and uh, looking into ways of uh, improving processes and uh, particular you know, instances. Um, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Um, you know, the work seems very interesting. The, you know, uh, right now, as we all know, the issues of, 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 of equity and inequity are really coming into stark relief with this pandemic. And uh, it's never seemed more important to focus on those issues and how we can address them, uh, you know, as, as a city and a, as a, a larger context. Um, so I don't, I don't have anything else to say, but I'm happy to answer any questions or. Uh, Diana, if you, um, my brother lives about a mile from Seton Hall. So if you ever have to go out there, I hope you'll stop by his house and say hi. <laughs> We're glad to have you on board. Thank you. I see Pam now, so. She's connecting to audio. Okay, good. Pam, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yay, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm say a few words I'm of introduction. Doing, I'm doing it from my phone because, because it's not working from the computer. Oh, okay. 
So I see you here clearly. I'm Hold sorry. on. Say that again. Hello. Are you there? I am. Yes. Yes. Okay. We don't see you though. Okay. Hold on. <laughs> Oh, it says the host has disabled the video. So yes, you have. Okay, I'm allowed. Can you see now? I can see you all. You just can't see me. I don't know why. I have everything open. I can see you and I can hear you, but um, Pam, Pam but, in yeah. the lower is your stop video in the lower left hand <clears throat> corner. Does it have a? It says, it says host disabled attendee screen sharing. Mine was mm -hmm. just saying that too, and then I was able to just get back on. So Denise, something happened where you were disabling our camera. All right, and it says start video and that's disabled. And so mm -hmm. I'm not sure what happened. Okay. Okay. Let me see. Okay, hold on. It says you asked me to start the video. There she is. There you go. Okay. <laughs> I, I see you. Okay, finally. <laughs> Good to see you. Finally. It's finally. a work in progress. <laughs> Good to see you. Yo. Okay. okay. Internet size is big. There. Okay. I can see you now. Can you all see me? Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. Okay, we're going to talk right. about the minutes for a few minutes. These are the minutes from February, the last time we were together. Wow. Okay. And we never, we have never uh, had a chance to accept them. Does anybody have any comments on the, on the minutes? Could we have a motion to accept the minutes then? I move. So moved. Okay. <laughs> second. This is Pam. I, okay. I, I second. Okay. Thank you. Um, any, no discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are accepted. Um, just a note. We, every year we, we write an annual report. We are writing it now. And this month you will have a chance to <coughs> proofread it. Even if you haven't been there, please proofread it at least to make sure that it's readable. Um, and those of you who know what happened during the last year, <laughs> please read it carefully. That'll come out soon. Um, Aisha is going to talk to us about Asian American relations and or Asian American harassment and discrimination. Yeah. Primarily, I guess, as a result of the COVID virus and the, the relationship, the, the relationship that was made between the virus and the Asia and Asia, the Asian virus, the Chinese virus. Aisha, you wanna sure. Tell us what's happening. Yeah, hi everyone. So, um, you know, on my work on the Governor's, Co Governor's Commission, there's been a lot of activity around this issue because there have been a lot of incidences. It's just they're not all being captured um, by the reporting requirements that they have set up. So like Attorney General Dana Nessel has set up a reporting kind of mechanism, but the definition is, is really narrow and that's just because that's the definition they've always used. Um, and it's not capturing everything. But anecdotally, uh, we've been told, and this is specifically by someone who heads up the hate crimes unit with Dana Nessel. And let me get her name. Her name's Sunita Dadamani. And she has said that there's there are there are incidences. So um as you, as you guys have probably heard and you know, you know, our elected officials are, are making it worse by the language they're using. And, you know, in Ann Arbor, having such a huge Asian American community, especially, especially East Asian, I think that it would be, it would be, it would be responsible for us to do something on this issue. 
And I've been approached by, I'm on this University of Michigan anti-hate task force. And it's a task force that's made up of uh, professors and of students. And when they heard that I was on the commission, they said, would the commission want to partner with us on doing some sort of work on this? And they have two or three different ideas. One of them is they would help to create like an educational curriculum that we could give to teachers and to schools, um, educating them on this issue. Another one is a student and a professor who work with an organization called Healthy Asian American Project, HAP. They're creating, it's modeled after, after something that's been done in other cities. And um, it's basically a webinar that they're going to give to Asian American businesses, and they're going to train them on how to respond to incidences of discrimination and what to do if it's happening and you see it. And then the participating business will get a sticker on its window. And so then other people will know that's a place to go if they're experiencing it. So there were a couple different ideas that they had, and they have a lot of interest in partnering with us on it. So I wanted to bring this to you guys and see what your guys' thoughts are about how we can kind of address this issue. And if there's interest in working with this group at University of Michigan. Are you working at all with the, the larger Asian commun community or is it all internal to the university? Oh no, I'm also working with, you know, the governor's commission and that's part of, so Attorney General Dana Nessel has created kind of like a task force of Asian American leaders. It includes all the commissioners of um, the Michigan Asian Pacific American Affairs Commission. MAPAC also really wants to do things with us, but they have asked if we could meet in like July because it's been difficult to coordinate things offline, but they reached out, the chair of the Human Rights Commission and the Civil Rights Commission reached out to me and said, we heard that you're on the Human Rights Commission. Ann Arbor has a big population. Would you guys want to do some work with us? So there's two opportunities. Thanks for reminding me of that, Leslie. Mm -hmm. um, that one kind of came out about a month ago. So I think it's an opportunity for us to do something on an issue that yeah. is timely and matters. And, and similarly, the, the Human Rights Commission has always had or has had since, 19, since 2010, at least dabbled in community, re community response groups. We were a community response group at one time when the Department, um, Michigan Department of Civil Rights was trying to put together hate crime, a hate crime net, a network of hate crime groups that would respond as a group in the event of a hate crime incident. Right. Or just incident of general hate. To, you know, to see how things could be improved in the city. And what, what you're saying sort of reminds me that we had a, a function of that, that might, well, this might be advantageous for us to help you too. Yeah. And I think, you know, the hate is happening, obviously, to, to many other communities um, and all the time. And so it's like, if we can, I, I think it also, we have to think about how it fits into the way that we've responded to other communities as well. And, um, but I think, I think this is, this is some, this is an issue where I've had other, other entities, other, other civil rights entities, and now an educational institution coming to us and saying, what are you guys doing on this? And mm -hmm. if you're doing anything, can we partner with you? I see a raised hand here. Yes. Um, council, council member Nelson has a raised hand, a question. Yeah, my, my question was, I was sort of, I thought a question that Leslie asked, but I didn't, I, it wasn't clear to me what the answer was. Clearly we have well, a large popula uh, Asian population in the city. And so my question, when she asked about whether it was internal to the university and was reaching out, my curiosity was whether it was, connect their efforts were made to bridge with um, organization, like city or like specific to Ann Arbor coalition, Asian American community organizations. So are you, sorry, just to clarify that question, um, are you saying, are they trying to bridge, are they trying to get involved at, with, with city government only in Ann Arbor? Is that what you're trying to, trying to ask? No, I think she's Maybe, I, mis maybe yeah. I misunderstood. Mm -hmm. 
you know, that's, no, what, I, that's what I was trying to ask also. I, are we just talking about the Asian community within the university or the Asian oh, community in Ann Arbor? That's what that, I was asking. Is that that's what correct you also, Elizabeth? That, that's exactly what I was asking because we have a significant Asian community. And yes. so for instance, when Mayor Taylor made a, um, made a presentation around this issue and around discrimination right. my initial thought was this is terrifying if this is happening in the city because mm -hmm. we have such a large population and it it was shocking to me like is this is this happening in the city and i i contacted chief cox and asked inquired if there had been any incidents and i don't i i well at, at any rate um that, that's why I'm wondering, because we have such a significant population here, it strikes me that there there would be a lot of community organizations in addition to whatever structures exist at the university. Right. No, that's a great question. And so I have been spending the last couple of days, you know, before our meeting, in preparation for the meeting, trying to get some data. And when I reached out to the head of the attorney general's hate crime unit, she said, I can tell you that we don't have any reports from Ann Arbor and Washtenaw. But anecdotally, there are reports. They just don't fit the typical definition. Mm -hmm. The best place to go for reports would be the Ann Arbor Police Department. Yeah, that's why I talked to Chief Cox. Right. And he wasn't aware of any. Right. So then this, what's interesting is part of this API hate group at University of Michigan, they're tracking it themselves. And they don't have like a narrow definition. They, it's, it's more expansive. They've tracked at least 30 different cases, I believe. And a few of them mm -hmm. have been middle school students. Which oh. is interesting. Yeah. Oh. So that is what gives me the idea of why don't we create some sort of educational curriculum against hate mm -hmm. for for teachers, for superintendents, and it would be great if we could work with HRC on this, is I think what they were thinking. Any thoughts about, uh, I, I think this is something we should be part of in some way, mm -hmm. but it's so amorphous, it's hard to know how to... The School of Education works on projects like this. Yeah. Um, they, they, this is the kind of thing that they, uh, like, uh, this is just totally, like, in their wheelhouse. Yeah. So we actually do have a professor who is from the School of Education. I don't know their name. They only joined in the last few days. And they are going to lead up this kind of curriculum development. Hey, um, Alicia, you mentioned yeah. that there were um, incidents that didn't uh, fit the typical scenario. What do you recall? What scenario or what type of incident? Yeah, uh, let me let me read the email from Sunita from the Attorney General's office. She said, "I've heard of incidences of Asian Americans being harassed in public. One incident at a grocery store, Asian American man. I think she was supposed to say she was trying to say face mask was yanked yanked off his face. Another who a woman was spit on. Racist graffiti at Stony Creek Metro Park." Zoom bombing has been reported. That was also talked about at the API hate group. Um, that Zoom Zoom bombing has been a thing within the schools. <sighs> the other thing that Sunita said is like the hate crimes unit was only developed last year, and so another part of the underreporting is a lot of people don't know about it. Mm -hmm. So that could be yeah. another part of what we do is like you know mm -hmm. we try to really promote. Mm -hmm that we promote that we also can you know report these incidences and that we can help mm -hmm. but also there's this larger state-based reporting mechanism mm -hmm. because well that's I, where i think that's where i wonder if it, there would be a big value to connecting with community organizations like city within the city not uh, like outside of of the university because that it's the what you're describing is things like at the grocery store and in communities where you know well mm -hmm. anyway yeah so there are there are some community organizations involved in this kind of UMish task force, which is interesting, like Healthy Asian American Project. But yeah, I agree. I mean, ideally, doing it with with community organizations, I think, would also would be best. I really like their idea of having that webinar for business owners, um, and just telling them like what to do if you see hate, and then giving them that sticker if they participate, and they can kind of be the people who help others in the community if they're experiencing the same thing. Excuse me, Denise, I think somebody's waiting and I, I, I don't have anything that will let me let them in. Hold on, let me see. I don't see anyone else. Okay, I got a message that said somebody was waiting, but I don't have. 
I still see 14 participants, one attendee, 13 panelists, one attendee. I don't see anyone else trying to connect, okay. not from my end. I didn't either. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how, who is, who is in, this is something we probably should talk about a little bit in a smaller, you know. I think that would be a good idea. Who is interested in this? Just thinking more about what we might do and how we might be able to partner. Is that does that mean no one? At the risk of overextending myself, which I risk all the time. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm definitely interested. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, I'm not sure that I can take on one more thing, but Aisha, I'm absolutely interested. Okay. So, Great. you know, let's talk through. I would love that, yeah. And, and so, oh, sorry. And there's the city part in the school. You know, this is where we run into issues often. And I think, you know, I don't want to put words on Elizabeth's mouth, but it's, you know, we we have this delineation between like we are we are HRC is of the city, and the city and the schools tend to have this line. Um, one group that I do sit on, and we're actually meeting tomorrow, is the city schools committee. We just meet every. Mm -hmm started meeting up again. Um, and we do look for potential partnerships. A lot of what we've been talking about lately has been a little more, um, at our last meeting, more sustainability focused, but there's no um, there's no limit on what we do. It's a, it's a pretty loose group. So, so if there is a way that I can help um, bring some of these ideas to, um, to my count, I have two, I'm the only council member, but there are a couple, um, trustees that sit in this group, I would be pleased to do so. Thank you. I think that I think that would be great. Yeah. yeah. Just I, I would be more most interested in in having people from the city know that they could call us and come to us. And we have already started putting posters out, but we stopped because of the pandemic and no one's been out. We've got posters in some of the communities, but not certainly not all of them that say, this is the way you file a complaint and this is what the Human Rights Commission does and these are your, how to find out what your rights are. Um, so I'd like, I'd like especially to, to have that information out to people and maybe meeting with groups of in Asian groups and letting them know that the Human Rights Commission is there and you don't have to be alone if you're getting harassed. There are ways we can help. So there's lots of things we can do. Um, I know schools is a kind of an odd place for us to be. Or we're, we don't. Yeah, you know, I I also think, I always forget to raise my hand, but I, I also think that there's work to be done in helping people understand what really constitutes hate, the manifestation of hate and harassment. Mm -hmm because it's so easy when you are the target of microaggression yes. to you know, internalize it. You don't know what to say in the moment. It's shocking when it happens. You second guess your own feelings. You know, why did that really happen? And so I think if we can help people um, broaden their understanding of even microaggression, I think that would be helpful in terms of addressing um, whatever hate and discriminatory um, actions there are out there because we know most, um, most folks in Ann Arbor have, a, have an open heart and an open mind, but you know, we're, not, we're not in a bubble. So I think acting as though there, there may be folks who um, do not think inclusively, and who have swallowed Trump's Kool-Aid, <laughs> right, might be in order. I yeah, mean, I mean, you know, there's no such thing, you know, as a virus from some, you know what I mean? Like, okay, okay yeah. that, that was, yeah. Okay, so, so it sounds like at least Tita and I and um, I just lost it. 
And Julie, when and Julie, I think Julie has a, her hand raised. Yeah. Now, I, I, yeah, she does. I, she I does. do want to hop back to this idea, though, Isha, that you had about this about this business piece, because I do think that really does fit under the city's purview. And I know when we've had other, you know, kind of national instances of, of hate, I think about, you know, like around right. um, immigration, for example, that we did have these signs of visibility, like this is a, you know, of community support, but also of, you know, in stores, like this is a, this is a safe and welcoming place. And, um, and if we think about kind of the broader welcoming community initiatives that are happening in the city and the county, um, I, I really like that idea. And I think that does fit in the, you know, in the city's wheelhouse. I don't know, like from a resolution or support or like what you would need from from us as liaison to get that going, but I I do you know I I do think it fits with other things that have worked very well. Aisha, do you know is it is Ann Arbor officially part of the welcoming communities group in Michigan? We are. I didn't yeah, know we that. are. We're considered like a welcoming community. So that is a good point. It's like we could integrate that into some of those effort. Mm -hmm. And I think too, um, oh, I wanted, I wanted to come back and answer something. A lot of the reasons why not all incidences are being captured and reported is because they're protected as like free speech. But mm -hmm. I think, I think that either way though, people want tactics on how to respond and how to deal mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. and that's from business owners to just mm -hmm. people. And I think that we could have a real place in developing something about this issue of discrimination and it could be used more broadly too mm -hmm. um, with all different communities that are being impacted by discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, Linda has her hand up. Oh, Linda. oh yes. I'm sorry. Hi. No, I just wanted to say that this does sound a lot like what Leslie had going a few years ago, which was a community response group for any kind of hate, hate thing that happened. I mean, she had representatives of churches, schools, the police, right. you know, all the sort of major institutions in the community that were supposed to meet on a regular basis so that <clears throat> if there's any sort of particular type of, of hate incident that's happening a lot, like now against Asian Americans, or just particular isolated incidents, that they would come together and support the victims and come up with some strategy, which is slightly different from what you're saying, Aisha, but it's, you know, it's all related. Yeah. 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 And, and it's working with community members. I mean, that that's the nice thing about it. People who are actually affected and who know what 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 would fly locally? What would Leslie, locally? Leslie, do you think it's possible to reach out to those folks again and reactivate? Uh, yeah, I mean, we'd have to start. We'd kind of have to start from scratch, almost scratch. But yes, we could do that. Okay. We never actually disbanded. We just there were years where actually there wasn't that much to do. Uh, nice. Mm -hmm. Those are not the years. The last ones we had had to do with our roster. So, uh, okay, so let's get together. Julie, are you interested in joining us in this? Julie is me. Yeah, I would be, I would be happy to. Okay. Yeah, Elizabeth, you also uh, were, uh, well, yeah, I'm really, I'm, I mean, I'm interested in the, the education piece of it because I just because I know that that's I've I've seen the kind of projects that the School of Ed works on. I could think of a couple of different ways it could happen. Okay, that'd be great. Let's get together and you know another time. But let's. Yeah. So do you want to tell them. me anything that you want me to take to that meeting at noon tomorrow? Yeah, I'll do like that. A little blurbish kind of whatever you think is appropriate. I'll be happy yeah. to share it. And you know, two other things is both a member of this API task force, and this API task force at UMich is affiliated with some, a, na a national initiative called Stop API uh, Hate, and they're collecting data of incidences all over the nation. It's 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 led up by a researcher at U, at U of M, so they said they'll report back to us and they'll give us more. 
But two things is one, a, they've asked, the task force has asked, can someone from their meeting come and talk to us about it? And maybe that would be better done like in a work group kind of setting with the people who've just said that they're interested. Mm -hmm. And then Sunita from the attorney general's hate crime unit has also said that she would come and talk to us about reporting and what's happening. And I think when, while things are on Zoom, it's, it's easier. So if, you, if we're interested in that. Judah? Yeah, I'd like to be included in that as well. Okay. 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 Let us go on. Wanted to take a, a minute or so to talk about I thought about it. Talk about source of income. We passed the source of income um, changes to the non-discrimination ordinance at our February meeting. And the city council passed it in April. It became effective probably the end of April. It became effective 10 days after it was accepted by the council and published. So it's, it is now effective. Um, but I got to thinking about it. And I'm wondering if landlords know about it. Mm. The city, the Human Rights Commission has never really taken a, um, the role of publicizing things, even when we passed the non-discrimination ordinance. We did not go out and publicize the ordinance, although that was, pub that was published in the newspaper and people knew. This has, uh, it's, it was on Legistar. There was an op there was a, um, you know, or what do they call it? A um, people could come and speak about it and at the city council meeting, but no one did. It passed. I wonder if landlords know. And I know that there have been some incidents of landlords declaring that we will no longer take vouchers. Vouchers are are subsidies for housing, they're a source of income, they're covered under the non-discrimination ordinance and they've been covered for decades. So I think if we want to prevent this from happening, somebody's got to publish, publicize it. Mm -hmm. um, and because it's, it's not something we've ever done before, I wanted to bring it to your attention and make sure that you were interested in taking at least some role in this. I think there are lots of ways to publicize it theoretically. And because everybody is, because it's hard to, to uh, contact people, I tried to contact the, the person who was in the head of um, rental investigations. Margaret, you know what this, whatever this office was called. Um, because they have a list of landlords and they're the people who investigate houses for other kinds of of housing violations. And they at least would have a list of landlords. But there may also be a landlord association. There may be ways we can reach landlords other ways. The, the first question is, do we, do we wanna take some role in making sure that landlords know that vouchers are source of income and you cannot discriminate on the basis of it. People have a right to pay using vouchers and they have the right to be eligible on the basis of their ability to get vouchers. Um, Council uh, Member Nelson has a hand up. Elizabeth. Yeah, I was gonna say, so because, because of the current crisis and a lot of conversations happening around rent and people's in inability to pay rent, I know that there's a landlord association because they contacted us. Okay. They contacted us and, and, want, and well, it doesn't matter why they contacted us, but they, they definitely exist. Like I have, if I search my email, I could find the contact information. So okay. that's one contact, but it strikes me in addition to that, it's almost just as important for people who are out trying to use these vouchers to be aware of this. Now, do we, do we feel like that visibility is, is as high as, as it can be? Like there are just, there are enough advocacy organizations 
around tenancy that 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 public awareness is is sort of already taken care of. You're you're Leslie. You're talking about like the landlord side of it that That's people right. understand. Right. Okay. The tenant side. The people. Gotcha. I know. I know. For example, that Jennifer Hall knows about it. I know that. I, I know that. Um, so so I know some people who are giving vouch. I don't know how many people give vouchers. Uh, okay. No. I wonder if Jennifer Hall knows that information. I wonder. No, but what I mean to say is I wonder if if she's a contact, if she could tell you that this is a matter of writing, you know, you could send 25 letters and hit every organization in in anywhere that would could be potentially giving a vote. I mean, well, from my experience, they, there have not been a lot of landlords that, I mean, she knows who takes them historically because there aren't very many people on that list. So, I mean, especially within Ann Arbor. Um, well, that's right, because I've, I'm, some vouchers would can go to anybody, I think. Yeah. Theoretically. So, I would think that's the whole point, right? Because it it's not, it, that you're not supposed to be able to discriminate against. It also, it also has to do with how much people charge for rent, though, right? Right. So, so, they, so that, that, then it doesn't make any difference. Yeah. They're not, they're not going to um, be able to. Linda has her hand up. Linda. Yeah. She would know, like, historically, and then I think she would also kind of have, some some information about who has traditionally been not as welcoming like more you know so I'm sure she has a list but I'm sure she also has like some I mean she worked with us on this right, right. So, but she was the one who suggested that we contact um, invent the investigation group yeah. and, and contact all landlords yeah, so I don't know who refer like she mentioned how our inspections unit um, landlords have to register with building um, for inspection purposes and so she suggested to me that we go through that okay. avenue. Yeah. Is that possible, Margaret? Yeah, I can I can get that list. You can get the list. Is it a can we do we have to mail it to that list? Do you know? Or is it uh, email? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I can ask them for what contact information they have on file. I would assume it's probably some people have provided email addresses, but mostly it would just, I, I assume you'd have to do it by mailing, which has a cost. That's what I'm afraid of, that it's a big job. I was going to respond, oh, respond to Elizabeth's question about the other side of the um, so along with Jennifer Hall, we know that Legal Services knows about it for whatever that's worth. So people who might contact Legal Services would know. It's hard to know. Um, I don't know. Are there any other sort of tenant organizations? Well, the, um, I just wanted to comment that um, everyone who receives a voucher is on a list. And folks waiting for vouchers are on lists mm -hmm. with contact information. So I think it should be fairly straightforward to get folks with vouchers and who are waiting for vouchers the information. Mm -hmm. um, I think the more difficult question becomes reaching the folks that they are going to um, apply, mm -hmm. to, or to which they will apply for housing. Wow. But you know, I'm wondering if we can't set up a way in which the folks who are applying for housing, you know, who are filling out applications, can distribute Ann Arbor materials as they go. Because, you know, you're going to approach four or five, sometimes 10 landlords and, and fill out applications before you actually succeed in, uh, in renting a place. So just a thought in terms of being able to, um, you, you know, utilize sort of a community organizing approach. Aaron, you had your hand up. Yeah, thank you. You know, so that's an interesting point because then this person hands in their application along with, a, oh, by the way, I know about this kind of thing. Right. Uh, <laughs> idea that I had. Yeah, so that's brilliant. Uh, another idea that I had, and if you want to get the word out, you can send it through Barrier Busters because that way a lot of the people who are helping to assist a lot of the people who are using these vouchers uh, are going to know about it and 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 follow. Up. Okay, can I can I assume from what you're saying is that you think we ought to take some role and try to get this publicized? Uh, yeah. So 
Yes, I think so. Oh, uh, I have a question, Leslie. Yeah. Are we, um, is the uh, Human Rights Commission permitted to do um, public service announcements on the radio? I don't know. <laughs> Julie, Elizabeth, are we? I don't know. <laughs> Because that's a, I, I imagine we could. I could imagine we could. Public I mean, it's very it's, on radio, right? Right, and it's very straightforward way of doing it with the limited time investment. And then we just take it. I mean, I know the three public service sort of public interest radio stations in the area are very good about playing, um, and EMU's news cycle in particular follows and will interview one of us if we contact them. So I, I'm just thinking let's we could use the radio as one means. Thanks. Pam, your hand is up. Yes, um, two things. Housing access for Washington County, also known as HAWC, mm. um, since we assist individuals with either um, eviction prevention or um, monies to assist individuals in obtaining a uh, rental. Um, locations would be um, a resource. So that's through the um, Salvation Army. And since you mentioned public service announcements, I've brought this up before in other venues. The um, CTN offers slots where you can do 30 oh. second promos and it might be advantageous for us to utilize that resource as well since they record us you know, when we have our regular meetings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, can I just get a, sh a show of hands or whatever you, how many people think that we should be, should we, we should be publicizing and that we should find out more and, and have a proposal? Everybody? You want real I, hands or, I should, or Zoom hands? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I found blue hands. <laughs> Okay. Am I right that everybody thinks we should do that? Okay. Then we'll then we'll we'll proceed with some assessment of all these these things, but okay. let's move on. Um there uh let's see, is everybody is that where I am now? Yes. No, trespass status. Linda, you want to talk a little bit about our trespass meeting? We had a trespass meeting. Uh, Judah was there too. Um, so Judah, Pam, Leslie, and I, and then several people from ICPOC Zoomed together um, to talk about what the Human Rights Commission has already done with respect to the issue of trespass and the process of working with ICPOC and kind of handing it over to them because it's really in their jurisdiction. They just didn't exist before, so we had it. Um, <clears throat> but putting together a set of recommendations uh, and points to discuss with um, the chief of police and um, Stephen Postomo or Arian Slay or whomever um, about further changes that are needed both both in the trespass notice itself, as well as the policies and procedures that the police use on, uh, on trespass, particularly reading trespass as opposed to charging somebody with the crime of trespass. So, um, so we, we were in uh, agreement about most of the things we talked about. We didn't cover everything. I, I offered to put together basically a bullet point list of all the, the things that we need to um, talk to the chief and um, Ariane or Stephen about. And I've sent it to, I did it, I sent it to Leslie who was gonna look at it. Then if she approves or makes edits, we'll share it with ICPOC. It's basically in the form of a memo to the, to the chief and to um, Stephen Postema. And then hopefully we can have a Zoom meeting with them and go through them all. You know, it's most of you who worked on trespass will be familiar with, with the issues. You know, the biggest one is probably the duration of the um, of the ban from a property that the default, and it's always a year, 
once a, a person has read trespass and told to leave and not come back, it's always a year, it can't be less than a year. And compare that to city parks where the maximum is 24 hours. It just doesn't make any sense. And the reason it says one year on the form is because that was the maximum allowed under law. Um, and so it was just sort of a convenient default. But um, the, the former chief didn't want to change it. We're hoping, and, and he gave sort of the, what seemed like a pretty lame excuse that it was administratively easier to have one year, always one year that, but every, every day that you give a trespass notice is gonna have a different end date, whether it's a month or three months. The question then is, do you leave it to the discretion of the property owner? Do you have some other shorter defaults? And then you have to be trespassed again if a person comes back afterwards and is misbehaving. So those are the kinds of things we need to talk about. And then there's a whole lot list of other things. But I think that if we could if we could get that one one thing changed, that would have that would have the, the biggest effect, probably. Does anyone have any questions? Pam, do you have something to add? Your hand is up. Mm -hmm. Pam, do you want to add to something? No, it was up from when you asked for the vote. Oh. I just didn't put it down. Okay. <laughs> oh, I'll put it down for you. You got it? Okay. I got it. Okay. Did you want to yesterday? I didn't catch it, but she talked at the city this afternoon that they had talked to him about trespass. So I don't know if some of these, any of I this can't was hear just, you. I can't hear you. I can't hear you, Margaret. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. that's better. Oh, sorry. Um, Chief Cox mentioned to me this afternoon that trespass came up in the IPOC meeting yesterday. So I don't know if you watched it, but it sounded like he discussed some of it yesterday. Yes. Okay. 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 Thank you. We'll have to touch base with that, but okay. I'm glad he's he's aware of what we're doing. Um, Pam, Pam and Judah were both at the meeting. Do you have anything else you'd like to add to the to what Linda said? I think you gave a good overview. Yeah, good overview. I have nothing to add. I was, I was happy to see that they they really wanted to do. They we we had very strong agreement on everything, so it was very it was very nice meeting. Um, I think we'll call a meeting. We'll try to get a meeting next week, and uh, you'll hear more about it. But I you got the minutes from the last meeting. Sure. Chance housing, this is the big thing on our agenda, the thing Erin is interested in certainly, and Margaret, and let us talk about it. Um, okay. A little bit of background. The commission has been talking about housing discrimination people face if they've previously been incarcerated or had past criminal history. Regardless of how many years have passed since the incident or the nature of the crime or what changes have taken place for them in recent years. Aaron made us aware of the problem and um, presented a case that made it clear that to us that uh, the reasons for discrimination against people who've been formerly incarcerated or have a criminal history are really not, th so the reason that there have been discrimination, um, on the housing discrimination to these people, really not supported by the facts. And it's make, it makes it very hard for them to reintegrate into the community and we can do something about it. Hopefully we can. Um, Margaret and Linda, Keita, and I have been working to find a way to give the applicants a fair chance at obtaining more opportunity to get housing. What I've done for you is I we've got two, two draft ordinances. And I'm not trying to get you to choose between the two, but they felt they differ in a very significant way. And I It'll help us to finish a draft that you can vote on if we know how you feel about the, the, the core issues about this, uh, where, they, where they differ. Okay, 
So the first one is entitled, I'm going to call them first and second, they have similar titles. One is called Fair Chance Housing, and it allows the landlord to use, they, they have to interview the, the applicant, give, be interested enough to give them a, a conditional okay for rental, and then they're allowed to look at criminal history records, and then make a decision about whether they want to actually offer the, go through with the rental. It's an interesting proposal. Um, there are a lot of pros and some cons to it, but it allows them, the, the key to this is it allows them to actually consider the criminal history as part of the reason why they should not, they, they don't want, they, why they, sh they shouldn't rent to this person. I had this, I thought I had this down so that I could say it articulately, but I obviously don't. Um, so this is, this is, will allow the, the landlord to say, yes, but you still were in jail, therefore we are not interested. No, in no, 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 but, but Leslie, let me qualify that. Okay. They would, they would still have to show that um, this person presents a safety risk to the other tenants or to their property. So th there would be okay. still some constraints on it, but yes, they'd be allowed to consider the criminal record, but they'd have to show there would be, there's a reasonable chance that it, that this person would um, pose a, a safety risk or, or would damage the property. Go ahead, sorry. Okay, I, I appreciate that, thank you. So at least they're allowed, they're allowed to consider it. And, and put it in as part of the justification for not, um, not, in, not renting to this person. The second draft doesn't allow it at all. They can find they can find all kinds of reasons not to not to rent to this person, but it can't be because of their criminal background. It's almost the same as it's the same kind of test that we use for the other protected classes in housing. So that if somebody came to us and said. Um, he says it's because of the fact that I drive a Toyota or <laughs> because I have a, a bad pay, uh, history of payments to my last landlord or something like that. But I think it's really because of my, my record. The second one doesn't allow them to, I've totally ruined it. Uh, uh, can I? There <laughs> Okay, somebody else. <laughs> uh, okay, so the second one and the both the first and the second one permit a landlord to exclude anyone where federal or state law requires the exclu their exclusion. That's true. So there, there's not very many cases of that. Right, but you can consider it. Mm -hmm. If in that instance you can refuse to rent to someone if required to do so. So there is that, you know, caveat. Um, that, and that is also true for the first one. You know, that would be a, an acceptable reason. Um, I guess my question is for both the first and the second one is couldn't we amend whichever option we choose? And I just thought about this yesterday. Um, and handle it much like we do employment, where the employer has to distribute a list of qualifications in order to create some standards against which people are qualified or not qualified for a job. Similarly, do they meet uh, whatever the stated credit score might be or how many um, housing references do they need and are they going to rent to anyone who's been evicted or you know what I mean whatever the categories are that the landlord wishes to evaluate I think should be stated up front so that it's possible to determine you know who is qualified and whether the person who was rented actually rented to fulfilled those qualifications in an instance where a person was rejected. So I, I just saw that both of those, both options mm -hmm. 
could incorporate that idea? Um, so it's sort of like a, a housing job, like a job description. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, sometimes we've got people renting a, they have, people have four rental units. Mm -hmm. um, some people, times they're, they've got a whole apartment building full of them. Mm -hmm. And what they have is a, a, a notice that says we've got an apartment available. Mm -hmm. So well, that's not, uh, I guess I would say that it's, that's not a reason to not require them because apparently all four apartments are then therefore being rented use, utilizing the same standards, right? Yeah, but right. right. So I'm just saying usually, you, Judah? Yeah, I just, Kita, can you, can you clarify a little bit? Are you saying that landlord should specify in advance which sorts of criminal convictions would disqualify someone from being a tenant? No, I oh, was no. thinking about other types of qualifications like credit scores, evictions, um, uh, good references, whether they're requiring a job. Although with our, although I guess you could still, that's a question that I have. Um, with our new um, provision against discriminating based on uh, the type of finances you present, could someone still require employment? I, but if they, you know, if they did, yeah. that would have to be on the list. That's all I'm saying. But no, I don't think um, I intended that. But if we choose the option that enables landlords to, um, to review someone's criminal history, I like it as an amendment, if that's the option we pick. Interesting. Because I do prefer the other one. Okay. Leslie, um, there, there's a curious expression on your face. I, 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 I've never heard of interviewing for, uh, I, I just think it's a, an interesting concept and I don't know how it would work to interview for getting an apartment. The, the person who's renting the apartment often just want somebody who will pay the monthly. Well, if you're, I mean, forgive me, but if, if you're, you're right. Caucasian, if you're Caucasian, that may be the case. You're right. I, I know, I know. You just, you just blow my mind. It's right? very different. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that has never been my experience. I think it might be helpful just to, to start with, I think, you know, Keto, it's a great suggestion, but I'm worrying that it's confusing the basic choice that's presented to us in the two right. ordinances, okay. and then we can talk about the other stuff. It's a good okay, idea. fair. That's and, and one, and then, and while we have Margie here too, mm -hmm. so and and Keita, Keita was the one who who brought brought the Oakland ordinance um, on fair chance housing to our attention. It's the Oakland ordinance that seems to be the most progressive ordinance out there, which is the one that basically says to the landlord no, you cannot exclude somebody on the basis of a criminal record period, mm -hmm. um, unless there's some federal or state mm -hmm. requirement or something that allows you to consider it, maybe even requires you to consider it. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so one is just a blanket, nope, sorry, it doesn't matter what this person did, when they did it, mm -hmm. can it be a criteria for denying them housing? The other one is, um, once you've made somebody a conditional offer, you can do a background check, and then you need to consider these kinds of things like when the crime happened, what was the crime, and most importantly, do the, does, is there any evidence that, that this person, based on those things, would present any kind of safety uh, risk to other tenants or to the property, or I, I think the property too, but mostly safety risk to the tenants. Um, so they're two yeah. really different things, and the second the second one gets really squishy, right? Because it's um, it's very hard to, you know, one person might think that a person who do, did X, uh, you know, however many years ago does present a safety risk. Another person might not. It's sort of a reasonableness standard, which which gets really squishy. And I mean, I think Keita and Keita Leslie and I really liked the, very, the simplicity of the Oakland ordinance 
if it will fly, you know, uh, to city council. No, yeah. because once a person has served their time in prison and is released, mm -hmm. I don't think it should be, a, it should, as long, you know, it, it, I think we have to assume, well, A, I mean, realistically, to be able to afford an apartment in Ann Arbor, they mm -hmm. probably have to have some resources or some family support. You know, and, and as Keita is alluding to, landlords find all kinds of other reasons to exclude people. Um, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, other, and I think Aaron in an email said the same thing, basically, that if a person can sort of even get to the point of being considered by a landlord, mm -hmm. chances are, you know, he or she, you know, mm -hmm. is a fine candidate. Um, uh, and then Margaret, Margaret's uh, response, and she can tell us, um, is that there may be some kind of insurance liability issues with landlords with respect to them having to do background checks. That may impact it was just my colleague Kevin McDonald deals with this, and he raised that as a potential concern that need a little bit more exploration before I could send you the notes on Monday. So. And that would apply to either either ordinance, really, right? Yeah. yeah. It would it would apply, especially if we pro prohibited people from looking, from actually doing the background research to see if there was a criminal offense. Generally, if if I don't know that that landlords are now expected to do that, but I know that big or big rental organizations often do it just automatically. Um, I mean, there's. Oh, sorry, Judah, go ahead. I just wondered, did anyone know offhand what are these federal or state law um, rules that might, that, you know, under that Oakland uh, standard that yeah. we would take into account? Aaron, you said that the only, the only one you know of is the uh, sex, uh, mm -hmm. There was, one about, sex there was one about making meth too. And that That's might right. be for high. Could only be for public housing, I'm not sure. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Public housing has specific requirements, but that's different. Mm -hmm. um, and, well, and even when it came to even when it came to the sex registry in California, I went to the California law because Oakland refers to a specific statute in the California law. It has one particular line in there, which which made it such that they had to include that as an exception in the Oakland ordinance. And then I went to the comparable Michigan sex offender law, and it didn't have that, at least, you know, I'm not saying it was, you know, conclusive. But so we took that part out and we left it, and we just said a blanket if there's a federal or state requirement. Um, we, in the Oaklands has this whole section on sex offense, sex offenders, and with reference to the California state ordinance. Um, I don't think we need that if we were to go with this this version. I, I, Aaron, Aaron, what do you think? As it pertains to that, I yeah, I noticed that um, as I was reading uh, this this draft, and you know, I think that there's pros and cons to it. And I, I'm going to bring something up to to what you stated from the previous discussion about source of income. Unless people know kind of what's behind the print, in this case. A person might not know. A person might have a record. The landlord says, well, yeah, okay, oh, you know, this fair chance housing thing's on the books, but, you know, state record, the state law says that I can, I can, um, I can bar you. And that's what, that's what I think could happen with ambiguous language. Mm -hmm. But that's just a thought. That doesn't, you know, mm -hmm. doubles it's a good thought. <laughs> and it does, up, it, it underscores it. Between the two, the two approaches. The, the blanket sort of ban on, on looking at a criminal record versus uh, if a person seems like they might present a risk to um, the safety of others based on the type of crime and when it was committed. Are you asking for my opinion on the blanket yeah. ban, basically? Yeah. Um, you know, I sent this in an email. I think my, yeah. my voice even just stuttered a little bit when it comes to that. I think that there's uh, supposed to be this this part of me that's just like, yeah, man, everything. No, but yeah. <laughs> the reality I think is is you know when 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 I facilitated discussions um, that have included uh, property management companies, mm -hmm. one of the things that they say is that you know they can ensure 
uh, prospective tenants and their current residents uh, of a certain measure of safety because they're able to do background checks. You know, and, and yeah. I think that um, as much as, uh, you know, it's my career and I, I, and I believe in, you know, the second chances and rehabilitation and, you know, all the things that I think that we all believe in, not everybody here. Right. Um, I also know that there is a, a certain percentage of the population that just, you know, you can talk about statistics when it comes to aging out of crime. You can talk about and, and how, you know, the brain development, a lot of people, like criminal activity for, for a lot of folks tends to drop off dramatically after uh, age 25. Right. You can talk yeah. about this yeah. idea of desistance where if a person has gone more than five years uh, without committing a new crime, regardless of the severity or the, the quantity of crimes that they have in their past, it's, uh, they become less likely than the general public to commit a new offense. Uh, and, and things like that can stand still, but I, I think that um, there is a certain proportion of the population that uh, habitually commits crimes and, and is not from desistance. And I think that without giving people property management the ability to look at that. I just don't know how they would ensure some level of safety or, or accountability, if that makes any sense. And I, you know, and I, it kind of pains me to, to just to say that to a certain extent. And I, and I'm, and I'm open to being wrong just because I just because yeah. I'm here doesn't mean that I'm right, you know, but that's just, that's just one of my kind of gut instincts when it comes to that. So how would you, the, my problem with that is that it's such a fuzzy, that whole reasonableness thing. Yeah. It's, it just leaves it, and, it, and it would always be easier for the property manager just to say no and take somebody without a criminal record. Yeah, the, uh, the, the loophole in the other one that's created by could this potentially hurt, you know, the, the business, it's, you know, it's huge. You can drive a bus through it. and, right. and I, Unfortunately, I, I don't know what the, I've got a couple ideas, you know, again, you know, being a little bit more specific with, with some of the language, you know, what it might look like to perform one of these um, uh, assessments to be able to really emphasize that the purpose of this ordinance is because we believe that people um, can be rehabilitated. We believe in second chances. We believe that the past can be the past and people can move on to a different future. Yeah. But to be able to get to that future, people need a place to be able to start in terms of you know where they live hey, uh, I, oh man i'm sorry i also you know it's interesting that this came up um earlier also you know there's another part of me that when it comes to applying for jobs um some jobs you go through a formal process and it takes them six months to clear a background check uh other <laughs> times people just show up somewhere you know and it's just like hey you good for it yeah let's go you know and you know to get to this other idea i guess you know one of the other things that i think about is is um i don't know practically what it might look like you know when when the when potential opposition or or more critical forces you know come up and really start taking a look at this and say well how will this affect me there's an there's a there is a part of me that, that wonders if there's any benefit to um, maybe say, say, telling businesses, hey, you know, if you're if you're worried about the stage at which you can run a background check, meaning you've invested a certain amount of time and energy vetting these these potential tenants, um, maybe it might benefit you to be upfront about what you won't accept. Be upfront about what? About what ab about what you won't accept. Okay. And I, and I think that there's big cons when it comes to that as well. Uh, because um, a lot of the things that I think that people tend to be most afraid of that sound sound the scariest uh, have some of the lowest recidivism rates. Yes. So. Right. Don't they actually already do that by banning it? I mean, <laughs> I mean, they already say they won't, you know, a lot of the big ones, right? I mean, that's they what don't you tell said. you. They don't tell you. So, you know, I, I showed you a list that, that has been used in the past by um, one of the major property management companies around here, yeah. but that's not public. Uh -huh. that, that's for back use only, and they're not supposed uh -huh. to talk about it. I see. Um, so that's a lot of- That's why we brought it to you. It, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question. 
It is. Yeah. A lot of the things that people tend to uh, currently get lifetime bans for are, you know, violent crimes, um, things like armed robbery, things like murder, um, things like arson and, and, and those kinds of things. And I'm not sure about arson, but, you know, as armed robberies and murders and stuff like that. It's not, I don't know if anybody else just had a guttural reaction, but I did. You know, but the reality is, is that those those are like the lowest recidivism, um, some of the lowest uh, uh, categories. Of, of offenses for recidivism mm -hmm. and the other part of that reality is that a lot of those people have done a significant amount of time during which it is more likely that they've gone through changes right. and uh, supposed to live. I, you know can um, one of the things we haven't discussed that I really want to discuss yeah um, is the disproportionate uh, arrest and conviction records of people of color. Right. I mean, it's huge. It's like six and times. It, hmm? It's six to nine times. Yeah, in, like in Michigan. So, uh, like, it is so huge. The chance for but a almost, white person to be in prison. But almost, no, no, literally, I'm saying it's so large that 15% of all the Black men in the United States have been convicted of a crime. I mean, it's taking out an entire, right, percentage of folks out of the community and hobbling them for the rest of their lives. I don't right. think that that um, that no, I do think it poisons any conclusion that can be drawn from a conviction because you're going to be excluding. A uh, disproportionate number of people of color. You won't be excluding um, Caucasians who may have committed the exact same offense and yet been given a lighter sentence if arrested at all. So, you know, it's, um, it's going to target a particular community and have a disproportionate impact on not just where they live, because I, I don't think people most in the community anyway, um, really grapple with the idea that if no one will rent to you, then you live in a stairwell or you live underneath a bridge. You know, maybe you have a relative with a basement, maybe you don't. And I, I think that um, the, the system is infected with racism. And um, it is a double reason. I mean, yeah. a lot of landlords won't rent to folks of color if they have a choice. And, you know, it's a double strike. And I think that um, studies have shown that um, certainly white folks on large, a disproportionate percentage, perceive Black people as more aggressive, as more of a threat than a similarly situated white person. And that's without a criminal conviction. Yes. So, you know, that's my, that's my fear. I mean, it's my current reality and I, I fear that reality continuing. Yeah. I, I think there are some things that we are sure we don't want, we want in this ordinance. The biggest question is, is, I don't know how, whether people can use just the fact that the person has been in jail. And maybe maybe it's not just the, it's the- But, but if you were in jail because you're a person of color- Right. Then how do you get to use that? Now they're, now they're being penalized forever. And you saw the statistic that said something like a third of the people who are in prison in Michigan are in prison because they don't have, they've been driving without a driver's license. I, that should not be a fact. <laughs> that shouldn't keep you from housing. I hadn't read that statistic, statistic. seriously? Seriously. Oh. Well, at, least, at least, I mean, I didn't, I didn't check it out personally, but it is on the internet for whatever it's worth. But I mean, I've heard it many times. Yeah, presumably that draft, of the, Margaret's draft that requires some sort of legitimate business interest wouldn't apply to some, to a person like that, 
applying for housing. It would apply to some crime that where the person might presumably pre be thought to present some kind of safety risk. So, but, so um, you know, I'm just saying that that would cut down at least a little bit on the numbers. I'm not advocating for that draft. I still prefer the Oakland draft, but um, but, but I if, think if, that takes up. Go ahead. If you have a DUI, yeah. Why can't you say I'm afraid this person will will drive drunk and hit one of the children in the complex? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it's like every kind of criminal offense. You yeah. could you could come up with an argument, right? Yeah. Okay. Just sort of why it's a crime in the first place. Right. Aaron. You know, I guess to that point, in uh, keeping things in perspective, you know, I have a I have a certain reaction towards not being able to check, but I'm also realizing that the type of individual that I described, the person who's constantly get, you know, habitually kind of getting in trouble, they're not likely to be stable enough to be able to, you know, provide the, um, you know, what they would need to be able to prove that they're a viable tenant. Which is, yeah, it's another side to it. Any thoughts about where <laughs> where to go next on this? We clearly want to have an ordinance that, that does better than what we've got now. And we want to have the best we can get without getting, you know, risking liability problems for landlords. Julie, are you? So what is, is the big con to the Oakland ordinance risking liability to landlords? Um, no, yeah. Margaret, you're shaking your head. What's what's the big? I'm mm -hmm. I'm just if it's if it's I mean, and I tend to have a bias towards like very clean ordinance. <laughs> like that's that's just um, because I also think you know we do it, and then maybe some other communities in Michigan that maybe they replicate it. So I'm, you know, I try to be cognizant of that too, and kind of my approach to policy but so so i'm trying i'm just struggling to understand like what the con is the con, is I, I think the con it has has something to do with limiting the the civil rights of the landlord to protect their business but it has the state and it has the state and federal out in it right so so we're not talking about like if we're thinking about what seems okay, maybe as a parent, like this is more threatening to me or seeing like um, some of the things my husband does like at the at the federal judicial level. But um, you know, I, I think about some of the people that he tends to detain, and it it tends to be like child pornography in a you know living in a dense area or. Um, so these are these are still state and federal issues that could exclude someone, right? Not necessarily. I mean, the, the even the well, I'm just trying. I'm trying to get a sense of like what would be a situation. What would be a situation here? <laughs> deal with these concerns about, you know, what what would what would bump someone out? For some, right now, they there are large property management firms that that exclude anybody who has any record whatsoever right but like if we were to the oakland ordinance who would get who would get ex, who would get excluded or included or you know who who would Let's say somebody who who was convicted of arson I, that to me is one of the scariest for no, our no, no, I think, Julie, you're asking if what we were federal to adopt the Oakland ordinance. Yeah, you're asking what federal or state laws. Yeah, what federal or state laws. Oh, and I don't know the answer to that. I don't think anything. <clears throat> Maybe the sex offender, but I don't know. And the sex offender laws are, have to do with, for example, where they can live and where they can't live. And I think that's up to the, I think that's the responsibility of the offender, him or herself. Yeah. Not the landlord, but I'm not but sure. I, I, just, I think that's an important question to understand what it looks like in practice to me mm -hmm. in making a call about which way I'd, I'd want to bring. We, and we had talked about calling Oakland to see how it's going, but it actually was just adopted in February. Um, so they've, <laughs> they they don't know. know. And, and yeah. given what's been going on, they probably don't have much of a track record. Yet. Yeah. 
There also, you should know if you don't already that, that, that Ypsilanti has put, put what, um, criminal record as a protected class. Is that true? And so that would just automatically have crim, uh, people with records and not rec everybody being treated the same. Would not, you'd not be able to discriminate against people with a criminal record at all. I don't, we don't, they and they, still they do just, a background check on anyone, right? Because there could still be something in a background check that would come up that would, that regardless of having a criminal record or not, might. Like what? I don't know for housing. I can think of examples in other cases, right? Like I. Um, Pure one question, council member. So I still well, I email exchanged with Linda and Leslie and we have our interns starting next week. So I've scored the first research assignment for one um, is gonna research the federal and state law question. Yeah, just so we can, just so we know. I mean, and like, like we're your liaisons, right? So like from my perspective, like unless it's outrageous to me, whatever the group decides, like I bring forward to council, like that's, that's, that's the liaison stuff, but but you know, and I trust all of your expertise, probably more than my own in this, but I would like to just have a sense of what it looks like in practice as well. Yeah. And also we did some preliminary research and there does not appear to be um, landlord liability yeah. for the acts of uh, a prospective tenant, whether they have a criminal background. Uh, a criminal uh, conviction or not. The landlord is only liable if that person has a spe has specific knowledge of a specific uh, offense that a tenant is about to commit. Absent that, there is no landlord liability for the acts of, of their tenants. So, and so therefore, screening folks on the premise that you are liable is, is, is a fallacy. I mean, and I'm not sure that we want to continue to reinforce that, that false understanding of their own liability. So Aaron's example of the landlord who said, I wanna assure my, you know, my tenants that I do background checks for their safety is mm -hmm. not, you say he should not be saying that. That's the but, state on liability doesn't have. Right, Google and doesn't need and, to take on. Right, and if I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. If there is a thought that um, screening out individuals with criminal background hits is um, is effective for keeping anyone safe, I think is another fallacy because you know the vast majority of crimes are still being committed and they're being committed by if they are being committed um tenants largely um from the research that i did are committing crimes on rental property most landlords do have security the larger ones anyway mm -hmm. and i think that that is um if what we're doing is trying to ass ass assuage fears, yeah. there are ways to do it without um, violating someone else's rights to house. True. And as Linda keeps reminding me, people can be evicted if they misbehave. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's another way of dealing with it. I don't know, you know, people have risks. We, uh, renting to people and maybe we shouldn't be as concerned. Maybe we should simply write it. Well, I mean, I would ask this. Um, who has a statute that requires a landlord to run a criminal background check on their maintenance staff who are given keys to all the units? Who runs the criminal background check on the manager? who has keys to all the units. Wow. You, you know what I'm saying? It's not clear to me that the threat is from the potential tenants as 
much as it is from those who are empowered with keys. And we use one standard for prospective tenants and we have another standard because that person is the business owner. Uh, I don't, that to me also doesn't seem effective. I mean, this methodology is not, it's not effective and it's discriminatory. Okay. Well, Kita, I, I would expect that landlords uh, would be liable for the criminal acts of their staff who use their keys. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, I wasn't talking about their liability. I just meant in terms of uh, assuaging um, other tenants' fears. I see. I'm just thinking that they would run criminal background checks on their staff with keys because if they don't, they are liable for those acts. They should. Yeah, yeah but they may or may not. We don't know because... Did people have any sense of, of which of those two they, um, did they have, you have any problems with either of those two um, draft ordinances that we should discuss? It sounds like we have, we have your, your sense. Le and Leslie, Leslie, could you word that? Like, could we just get a sense of where people stand on which one and let's see? Yeah, okay. Would you want, you want to go around the room or, I mean, how yeah. do you? Yeah. I might, I've had my hand up for a, a little minute. I'm sorry. I, I just, I, sure. Oh, no, I just, I, I've just been listening to Kita and I, and I've found her words extremely compelling. And I, mm -hmm. I really am in leaning towards not allowing these, these checks to happen at all. And I, and I'm sort of combining that with the, the comments that Aaron made about realistically, the person who is, is able to jump through all the hoops of an application to persuade a landlord that they are a, a um, an eligible tenant. Um, I, I just, I, and, and I don't know that I buy the argument that land, it's been a while since I rented, but I'm not sure that I buy the argument that landlords are marketing their apartments by saying, I do background checks. So you're living in a safe community. I, that just, that strikes me as bizarre. And I, Akita, I totally agree with you that there are so many other safety measures that make a whole lot more sense for a landlord to market their community as a safe one um, that don't have anything to do with discriminating based on this. And so I'm, I'm just really leaning towards just not allowing the search to happen at all. The background check, I mean. Anybody else? No, no. Well, I, I'm definitely in favor in principle um, as Elizabeth and Kita, and I think you too, Leslie, I don't know, maybe you changed your mind, uh, to go with more of the Oakland model. Um, but yeah. I, I would like to, you know, let Mar I would like to let Margaret's student research whatever okay. parts mm -hmm. of it that, that she can, maybe even, they, maybe even you would want to call Oakland, or we can, see if they have any, um, any words to share on that. Um, we can reach out to them. Yeah. Yeah. Linda, I'd really love to do that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I agree with oh, Aisha. I was just going to say, I, I agree with Elizabeth and with Kita. I think that, as Aaron said, I mean, tenants who have probably like severe and persistent mental illness are probably people who are reoffending, and a lot of them are not applying for. For apartments. And that's just as a social worker and doing work in that community. Mm -hmm. I I've never seen that before. It takes a certain level of, you know, functionality to be going and submitting an, an application for an apartment. I think I'm I'm leaning toward what you're both saying, but I do not like the idea of forbidding people to you to do a background check that seems to put us in, seems to violate this, the, the civil rights of the landlord and to um, get us maybe more liability than we want to, to make it forbidden to do so. But I think you can, I'm very comfortable with saying you can't use it as one of your justifications for not renting to somebody. Does anybody feel that way, or am I the only one? <laughs> I, I I just want to comment. I don't. I yeah. think I think that the we're using the term, or you're using the term civil rights incorrectly. 
I don't, I, I don't know that the landlord, it, it's a civil right of the landlord to protect his property in the way that you're thinking. I don't, I don't think that that's, that's no, but that's anybody can go online and get and get a background check done on anybody. So to to say you can't get a background check on this one person because he's, you know, he's he's uh, put in an application, doesn't seem seems to me to be violating civil rights. I don't know. But just because they can do it doesn't mean it's right. No, I don't say it's right. I just I don't know, but I, I mean. The, uh, yes, they can access the information, but I mean, they, uh, they'll they know I'm black when I walk in the door. They don't even have to go on the internet. Right? <laughs> right? And, and, they're still, and they're banned from using that. And I, I, I don't see, I don't, I agree. I don't see the civil right involved. You don't? Okay. Mm -mm. Okay. Anything else? Anybody else have a thought? On I that? like the open model, and, uh, and I like the idea of checking in with them and seeing. I know it's it's new. Let's do that. Uh, but when they get some experience, um, that would be good. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? I we I think we just wanted to hear all the the thoughts and ideas about how to put it together, and you will get a chance to look at it again. Don't worry. Um, and it sounds like everybody is more or less convinced that the Oakland model is it, and I, I'm pretty close with that too. Okay, should we go? I think we're, we're about done. I wanted to make a comment about conversion therapy. I know people are waiting for it because we talked about it at the same time and it's the last on our list. Um, is anybody interested in doing any work on it? I've asked three times and okay, Diana, anybody else? Linda and I, okay, anybody, that's it. You will be hearing from us and we'll start working on that soon as well. And this ordinance, I think fair housing is, fair chance housing is getting close to being finished. We need to do a little bit more research, Margaret, your people will help and Kita, your calls will help. And I, and I think we also ought to find out if, uh, how Ypsilanti's new um, anti-discrimination ordinance making criminal background of protected class, how that's working. Uh, but that's even more broader based than this. That has a, a lot of opportunity to have problems if it's going to. But this was a good meeting and in that we got a lot done. I'm sorry that I was incoherent. Um, and I think that I don't think there's anything else on the agenda. So we can move. Excuse me? You say just adjourn. Um, well, I need to communications or adjournment. Any, yes, any, any new business or any communications from commissioners. Now, can we have a, a, a motion to adjourn then? I'm I just want to say something quick. I'm just so glad to see Pam here with us today. Yeah. Yes. I didn't get to say that when you came in. So True. absolutely. You uh, absolutely. Yeah. Before we all push buttons and get Thank off. You. Mm -hmm. Anything else? See I'm not to all of you, but like <laughs> especially Pam. We need a motion to adjourn. A motion to adjourn. I'm, I'll second. All in favor. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, bye. Take care. Be safe. Bye. We'll keep in touch. Okay. Bye now. Bye. bye.